This is the Maputo Katembe Bridge, the longest suspended bridge in Africa. It was built by a Chinese company, while most of the funding came from the Chinese Exim Bank, a state owned bank. And this is the Mombasa Terminal, part of the Chinese built Mombasa Nairobi railway system that paved the way for Kenya's economic rebirth. They represent just a tiny bit of China's investments in the African continent in the last two decades. It basically started in 2001, and by 2014, China had already granted more than $86 billion in commercial loans to African governments, financing more than 3,000 critical infrastructure projects. In 2017, more than 10,000 Chinese-owned companies were operating in Africa. In 2018, China was Africa's biggest creditor, accounting for 14% of Africa's total debt. As of now, China is Africa's largest trading partner. And if you look at this graph here, you'll see their trading relationship has only been growing too. But why is this? Why is China pumping so much money into Africa? Well, the short answer is influence. And influence in Africa, which is the richest continent in the world in terms of its natural and mineral resources, is huge. This is all part of China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI for short. The main goal is to construct new trade routes connecting China with the rest of the world, and thus establish a huge interdependent market for China. It's essentially China's version of a 21st century Silk Road, and this is something Europe just can't afford to ignore any longer. So, in February of 2022, at the 6th European Union-African Union Summit, the EU made a play to rival China's influence in Africa, announcing a $171 billion financing package for projects and developments in the continent. This funding will be spread across seven years and account for half of the bloc's total capital allocated to its global gateway plans, pitched as an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative. It will be pumped into various sectors, including green energy, health, education, digital infrastructure and transportation sectors. Now, Africa is Europe's closest neighbor. The ties that bind Africa and the European Union are broad and deep as a result of history and proximity. But this isn't necessarily a good thing, considering what that history exactly is. Europeans and Africans have a tangled history of colonialism that still haunts their relations. But that's honestly just putting it lightly. The fact is, Africans trust China more than it does Europe, and this chart shows it pretty well. China at the top, and former colonial power, the most hated. Not to mention also the least liked only after Russia. Now, China knows this. Current Chinese President Xi Jinping has constantly spoken out about the similarities between China and Africa at the hands of Europe's old colonial aspirations. And their unbreakable brotherhood forged from the struggle against imperialism and colonialism over the past 65 years. Africa simply has no reason to distrust China like it does Europe. They have no colonial or imperialist history in Africa. Once you combine this with Africa also seeing China as a fellow third world country that has grown powerful and influential and wishes to duplicate its success, then you know Europe is basically fighting an unwinnable influence war. Then there's the matter of the loans themselves. While the EU is very generous with the loans and grants they give to Africa, they're pretty complicated in the way in which they're given. As far as many countries in Africa are concerned, the money comes with red tape and lectures on human rights. What the EU sees as good governance, the African nations might regard as bureaucracy. Now compare this with China, whose no-strings-attached policy for loans and grants made them more easily accessible to African regimes that are shunned by the West due to human rights violations. The leaders, some of whom are dictators, can simply accept these loans with no accountability required in return. So they do, and then establish greater trade relations. That's how you end up with this, a Chinese trade takeover of Africa. So what can the EU do? Well, at that same European Union-African Union summit which we just talked about, African leaders asked for a change of mentality in their relationships. Africa no longer wants to be considered as a donor-recipient continent, but rather an equal partner. As a result, the EU went to great lengths to illustrate the equal African-European partnership through various PR campaigns aimed at capturing the hearts and minds of the African people. Another thing that seems to be happening is the questioning of China's loans to Africa. If you take a look at this map here, all of these red lit up dots are significant financial projects or political donations that China has contributed to Africa, fully funded by China itself through loans and grants. Now, there's a lot everywhere. And this isn't bad. I mean, China has probably helped Africa more than the West has in the 21st century. But it's a question of vulnerability. Since 2010, a third of Africa's power grid and infrastructure has been financed and constructed by Chinese state-owned companies. 
Then there's the digital vulnerability. The multinational Huawei technology company, the giant telecom provider that has been banned or blacklisted in many Western countries due to allegations of containing backdoors enabling surveillance, spying, and espionage, is growing in Africa. It currently makes up around 70% of 4G networks across the continent. Take a look at this graph here. Although there's not a lot of red marks, the potential for there to be is. Hidden from the end user are so-called middle boxes. These distribution stations forward information and are capable of filtering and manipulating information. For example, in Burundi, the government blocks media outlets that have criticized the president. So for all the current countries in red, censorship is currently happening. Now that's a lot of power in China's hands, something which Europe is currently planning to fight for. In terms of the energy sector, green energy is something which Africa wants, and the EU has a greater grasp of knowledge of this than China does. The EU's global gateway package will allow for an increase of renewable energy capacity by at least another 300 gigawatts by 2030, as well as a massive deployment of hydrogen production. To put this into perspective though, 1 gigawatt is enough energy to power 750,000 homes. So 300 gigawatts means an insane 225 million homes will be powered through renewable energy. And with the African continent accounting for 30% of the world's wind resources, and their theoretical reserves of solar energy accounting for almost 40% of the global total, their green energy potential is unbelievable. Now, according to the EU's global gateway plans to counter Huawei's network, Brussels is eyeing a secure international submarine fiber cable connecting the EU with Africa along the Atlantic Ocean coast, ensuring the highest infrastructure and cybersecurity standards. It's a counterplay, but the lines start to get blurred when you realize France's major telecom operator, Orange, is the one that's beginning to roll out Huawei's 5G gear in Africa. But that's for another time. So China has been building all this stuff in Africa, right? And all this stuff takes a lot of money to build which China has been paying for, of course, but the way that they've done it has made some people suspicious. Between 2001 and 2018, China invested $41 billion in Foreign Direct Investment, or FDI, into Africa. But in terms of loans during that same period, they loaned $126 billion to multiple African countries, which is obviously way more. Now, some people look at this and say it's a debt trap, which is basically when a developed country gives tons of loans to underdeveloped or developing countries in order for them to develop their infrastructure. A lot of the time, these countries won't be able to pay it back. And if they can't pay back their loans by a certain time period, then the developed country takes control of its trade routes or something very important in return. I'm not going to say what China is doing is debt trapping Africa though, because honestly, there's been very good counter arguments to this idea. And really, it might just be the IMF projecting what they actually had done in the 60s and 70s onto China. So we have to wait and see. But this doesn't stop anyone from being suspicious of China. Some African countries are rethinking their relationship with China, and some are suspending or abandoning contracts with Chinese firms. No surprise either that most of the projects being cancelled are part of Beijing's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. It all started in April 2020, when Tanzanian President John Magufuli reportedly threatened to cancel a $10 billion project launched by his predecessor, because the Chinese funding came with a condition that only a drunk would accept, he said. Then after, Ghana scrapped a $236 million contract with Beijing Every Way Traffic and Lighting Tech Company to develop an intelligent traffic management system. This made President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Felix Tshisekedi, call for a review of mining contracts previously signed with China in 2008, resulting in him saying he wants to get a fairer deal since China is only getting richer as the DRC remains poor, and that they are destroying the environment. It's tons of stuff like this that's starting to make Africa less trusting of China. And it's another opening for the European Union to get back into the tug of war. It will be a hard battle though. China has established 25 economic and trade cooperation areas in 16 African countries as part of its new Silk Road. And they have a very strong relationship of interdependence. Put simply, Africa has a lot of natural resources and needs a lot of money, while China has a lot of money and a growing need for natural resources. Obviously, this is also why Europe is targeting Africa. 40% of the world's gold and up to 90% of its chromium and platinum are in Africa. The largest reserves of cobalt, diamonds, and uranium on Earth are there too. Not to mention it holds 65% of the world's farmable land. I mean, these are all reasons why Europe was there in the first place. But now, this is a battle of soft power. So with China and Europe locked into a tug of war, with the winner hoping to steer the economic wheel of Africa, who has the best chance? 
But more importantly, is it possible that Africa can be the one that gains the most from this influence war, as they deserve to?